Good morning. Welcome to Indian Creek Church of the Brethren. You can't hear? Can you hear me? Well, there we go. <laughs> Welcome to Indian Creek Church of the Brethren. We're always encouraged to see people here in person, but we're also thankful that people can join us online. And whether you're here or watching online or watching later, we hope you are encouraged by the service today. Um, please let us know if there is any way we can help you. This morning, we will welcome Brandon Hanks as our guest minister. And along with Brandon, he has a whole row of family members I'd like to welcome too. I'm proud to say that uh, his mother, Annette, is my best friend from working at Kencrest, and we're still friends today. So uh, they're some of the nicest people you could ever meet. <laughs> okay, um, now if Sarah would like to come up and give us an update on the search committee. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I have an update for you. First, I want to say thank you for everyone who has turned in their survey already. You guys have done a great start. There's more of you here, though, than surveys that I have received. So some of you have not turned them in yet. Please do that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the survey today, just because there's been a few questions regarding that one to six scale. So Dennis, how this scale works. You have one, two, three, four, five, six. Dennis, our example. We're gonna go with this. So, I did the ice cream as an example because we're brethren and we like ice cream. So, the scale, if it was ice cream, one would be you prefer vanilla, going all the way up to six, you prefer chocolate. So, my answer for this question would be a four. I generally go for a twist. I like chocolate and vanilla, but I lean a little bit more towards the chocolate side of things. Now, if you ask my mother her answer to this question, she's a big old six. If they do not have chocolate, she's not having ice cream. So where I would be a four of, you know, okay, I'll eat chocolate, I'll eat vanilla, it doesn't really matter. Prefer chocolate a little bit more, but I like a twist. My mom would be a six, chocolate or nothing. Now, if you ask Micah, my son, who is two, he will eat chocolate. He loves chocolate. He will always say, yes, chocolate. But if you put vanilla in front of him, he will scarf that down just as much too. So that would be a five for him. So when you're thinking of filling out these questions, it's a scale. So one would be you lean all the way towards vanilla, six all the way towards chocolate. If you're somewhere in the middle, you just check which one you will pick in that middle spot. Dennis? How the calculations are going to work. I have really fun statistical analysis programs. Math isn't my strength, so I just input all these numbers into these programs and it spits out all the averages for me. It gives me all the information that I don't have to do a single thing. It's quite lovely. Thank you, grad school. Uh, so the program gives me all the numbers and then I just input them into the profile. It's all going to be reviewed by the search committee before we send it off to the, for, for the district. So all this is going to be reviewed, make sure we didn't do anything wrong, no mess ups, all that stuff. And then why this is so important. Number one, your voice matters. You are an important part of this congregation and we want to make sure we hear from you. We also really want to ensure that our church is being accurately reflected in the profile we give to the denomination. We want to make sure, are we really a one or are we a six? Are we, hey, we are only a vanilla ice cream kind of church or are we, you know, kind of, we can do a twist every now and again. Where do we fall in that? We want to accurately portray that to any potential candidates. So it's really important that we get as many answers as possible to make sure our congregation is accurately reflected in this. Last point, this is your future pastor. This is going to be the information given to the person we ultimately hire. 
So it's your pastor. This is your spiritual journey that is being uh, impacted by this. So it's really important that everyone submits the survey because of these reasons. Again, if you have any questions, I am more than happy to walk you through whatever. I can sit down with you and go through question by question. Um, really, whatever needs to happen, we want to make sure that you are able to confidently fill out the survey. So if you have any questions, a lot of you have already asked, please let me know. I am more than happy to help. Okay. All right, and I think that's all my updates. Okay. Thanks, guys. Oh, June 2nd, next week, y'all. Next week, I better have my mailbox full of surveys because we want to make sure we get them all, okay? Cool. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, for announcements, you should have gotten this in your bulletin, uh, but I'll highlight a few things. Um, one thing, June 2nd, the same day that you need to have your surveys in, is also our church picnic. So it will be right after the service, and um, you're asked to bring either a dessert or a side dish. Everything else will be provided. And if the Hanks family wants to join us, <laughs> <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> okay, we are also collecting the baby bottles. Um, you have until Father's Day for that. Uh, that's uh, to raise money for, now I'm sorry, I forget who it is, Morningstar Maternity Home. Uh, so you can, if you haven't already, pick up a, pick up a bottle in the Narthex. Um, the, the peanut butter and jelly sandwich makers are meeting the first Tuesday of the month. Uh, so the next meeting is June 4th for anyone who would like to come help uh, to make sandwiches for the homeless. Um, let's see, and BBS registration uh, goes until the end of June. Uh, so I think you can find that in the North X as well. Um, I believe that's everything. Oh, I, I want to mention, too, that the offering plates are in the back, if you want to make, leave an offering there. Um, and the friendship pads are at the end of the aisles to sign in so that we know that you were here. Okay. Well, now please join us in preparing your hearts for this time of worship as we listen to the prelude.
Thank you. Would you join me in prayer now? Lord, you are our refuge and strength and our ever-present help in trouble. As we gather to worship you, we ask for our hearts to be open to your presence. Fill this place with your spirit and our souls with your peace. Let every song and word spoken glorify you and draw us closer in communion with you and with each other, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, now we have our call to worship. If you would join in responsive reading with me, I believe the words will be up there or they're in your bulletin. Uh, this is taken from Romans 12, one to two. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice all holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. Okay, please join as we worship together in song. All the songs today will be out of the red hymnal. Um, the ones we're doing right now are number 434 and 572. And if you are able, please stand.
now it's time for uh, prayer for members and friends of the congregation. You should have a list in your bulletin. It's orange this time. Um, of course, please continue praying for our church at this time of transition. Uh, pray for Jane's cousin, Aaron, who's caring for her sister uh, and her mother, Nancy, dementia, who has dementia. Um, uh, Donna's grandson, TJ, is still undergoing testing. Please pray for answers. I can see her here. Uh, Jeanette Stewart's friend, Donna Marie, uh, has not had additional improvement. Um, and as part of our district program to pray for different churches, this week we're asked to pray for the Paxton congregation in Harrisburg. Uh, pray for the women in our loss and longing mom support group. Uh, of course, those suffering in Israel and Palestine and also in many other countries, um, including Ukraine, Nigeria, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Haiti, South Sudan, Syria, Yemen, and other parts of the world. Uh, please remember our family with ongoing concerns. There's a list there. And our homebound members, or our mostly homebound members. Uh, and there is a list there. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we are thinking about all the people who are, have health issues who we've mentioned here. Uh, we ask for your healing and also to give those people who are caring for them the strength to do so and the patience. Lord, for the people who are suffering emotionally, we ask for your peace and your comfort. Um, especially for the countries now that are experiencing war and violence and hunger, the ones that we have listed, we ask that you would send solutions and help end the conflict and bring people, your people, to come help in solving the problem and healing the pain. Um, we think of our people who are, are homebound, that we care about. Please bring them to our minds so that we can reach out to them. And remind us to pray for these people. We're so thankful that when two or more are gathered in your name, that you are here in our midst. And we hold that uh, as a promise. And now, Lord, we ask for all of these things in, your, in the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, we have a, a scripture verse. Scripture focus is Luke 7, verse 36 through 50. I think it may be on the, nope. maybe not on the screen, <laughs> but I'll read it anyway. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered, answering, said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. 
Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now before we sing our next hymn, the children are dismissed for Children's Church. You can go to the, the back and the pretty lady with the red hair is going to take you right there. Her name is Jane. Miss Jane. And while the children are being dismissed, you could look in your red hymnal again for uh, hymn 705 and please stand as you are able.
Well, good morning. Great to be with you here this morning. My name is Brandon Hanks. I'm grateful to be here at Indian Creek and grateful that God is faithful. Amen. I want to need a little more participation. God's faithful. Amen. 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 I want to get, begin by just praying this morning as we step into this time of reflecting on that passage in Luke 7. So, God, we thank you that your presence is here in our midst, God, and we're grateful for your faithfulness, Lord. Just thinking about that song, it is well with my soul. Our sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and we bear it no more. God, you are so amazing. God, you are so faithful. Lord, none of us come this morning uh, having it all together. God, we, we just confess that some of us have had a week, some of us are wrestling with faith this morning. We confess, God, that when we look back at our life, we recognize, God, that our sins have been many, but your mercy is more. God, you've been so incredibly kind, and it's our joy to not just be called servants, it's our joy not just to be called children, sons, and daughters, but it's our joy to be called your friends. Thank you, Lord, for choosing us. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving us. Thank you, Lord, for being full of mercy. Lord, we pray that you would help us today. Holy Spirit, we're asking for your help, that your word might be more alive in our minds and our hearts. God, you know what each of us need this morning, and so we're asking, Lord, that you would speak not to us only collectively, but to each one of us specifically. Help us to hear your voice today. We love you, Lord, and all God's people said, amen. amen. So jumping in here to Luke 7, I titled this message, Extravagant Worship, Extravagant mercy, or should say it differently, extravagant mercy, extravagant worship. I um, love this story in Luke's gospel. It's one of those stories that, for those of us that have been to church for any length of time, might make us feel a little uncomfortable, the way that this woman responded to Jesus when he was at this party. But I just want to remind us this morning as we jump into the text that there's something about worship when we recognize what God has done for us, and we know that we're forgiven, we know that God's given us mercy, that our desire is to respond with praise, amen? Our desire is to want to say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done. And that comes out of a heart that just wants to express our love towards God. So as we're jumping into Luke chapter 7, I just want to draw your attention to earlier in Luke 7, uh, just before that in verse 34, um, Jesus points out that the, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. This is on the heels of this moment that Jesus has with this woman and with this Pharisee and these other people at this, at this party at Simon's house. And I just want to point out this phrase that he was called a friend of sinners, Friend of sinners. I want you to do something for me this morning as we're getting started. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, I have a friend. I have a friend. We recognize that we have a friend in Jesus is because he's a friend of a sinner like me and you. And the beautiful part about the mercy and the grace of God is that he doesn't just call us sinner anymore. What does he call us? He calls us friend, but we're also considered saints. Amen. And so when we're looking at this text, we see that there's three parts, and I want to just walk us through this text. There's three parts here. The first is that we have the situation, and that's in verses 36 through 39. Then we have the instruction in verses 40 through 47. And finally, we have the revelation in verses 48 through 50. So let's first look at verses 36 through 39. The scripture reads again, one of the Pharisees asked him, that is Jesus, to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house, reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city, 
who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman that is, this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. In the story, we see that there's a setup here, and it's an intentional setup for us to see the two other main characters of the story. So obviously, Jesus is the most main character, amen? He's the most important person in the story. But then we see two other people. We see Simon. Simon is the Pharisee who invited Jesus over to his house. And you have the woman who is known as a sinner who is pouring out her worship and her love for Christ. And so we're supposed to see in this, in this story this picture of these two people and how they're responding to Jesus. I want to point out is that when we think about this story and we think about all the stories through the gospel, Simon's inviting Jesus over to his house. And there should be this question in our minds for anyone who's read through the gospels, is, is Simon setting up Jesus for one of those traps? Why is Jesus uh, agreeing to go over to Simon's house? What is the purpose of this visit? But I just want to draw you back to verse 34, that Jesus is a friend of sinners. He's a friend even of the Pharisee who doesn't realize how much sin he has to. But he invites him over. Jesus obliges. He is there. And while he's there, you see this incredible thing happen. He's reclining at a table. And, and just to give you a visual, we recline this way, right, with our feet out. In their day, they reclined backwards. And while he's there and they're reclining at the table, they're eating. Um, they're, they're there. This woman comes in who is uninvited to the party. No one asked her to be there. But she says, it says in the text that Jesus, that, that she knew Jesus was there. And so she goes there anyway, uninvited. And she begins to cry and weep and begins to wash Jesus' feet with her tears. She begins to use her hair to, to, to dry his feet and she begins to anoint his feet. And it's sort of the elephant in the room, isn't it? I mean, how many times did this happened at your house, right, when you had a dinner party? Um, it's one of those things. And so you, the, the host, Simon, it says here they thought to himself, you know, if Jesus was actually a prophet, he would know who's touching his feet right now. He would know that this woman is a sinner. And this is what we see moving in to verse 40 here. It goes on to say, and Jesus answering said to him. How many people know that Jesus knew Simon's thought? He knew exactly what Simon was thinking. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom the canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears. And she's wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. This is the second part I want to point out is the instruction. How many of us know this morning that, that Jesus is an amazing teacher? He's always teaching us, right? He's always instructing us in the right way, and so he takes this opportunity as he's sitting as a guest at Simon's table to tell him a parable. And it's a very simple parable, right? There are two debtors. One owns five, owes 500 denarii, one owns 50. Um, to give you a little bit of context here, uh, one denarii was about one day's uh, wage of labor. Uh, one day's uh, wage of labor. So you figure out how much money that is, I don't know how much you make, uh, but you figure 50 times that or 500 times that. The idea is that it's just a lot of money, right? And he says, you know, there are these two debtors, and when they could not pay, the, the person who uh, who extended the credit, just canceled it, forgave that debt. And he asked the question of Simon, 
you know, which one of them will love more? Which one will love that person more? I want you to think about in your context, how many people here have a mortgage or had a mortgage or had a car debt, write a note? If you got a call from your banker and they said, we just want to let you know you owe X amount of dollars, but that's all been forgiven, right? That's all been canceled. How many of us would be pretty excited about that? How many of us would say, we love this bank. This is an amazing bank. We tell all of our friends about it. You should go get a mortgage here. You should go get a car loan here. It's a rightful response because the debt was rightfully owed. And so the fact that the debtor forgave it is a big deal. The fact that the debtor said, you know what? You don't owe me this anymore. And so Simon's a smart man. He says, well, obviously, the person who uh, had the larger debt will probably love him not more. I suppose that's the person. And Jesus says, you've judged rightly. And then Jesus does this thing. He's at the table. He's talking to Simon. And while he's still talking, he looks over at the woman. He said, do you, do you see this woman over here? Right? I want you to look at this woman. Right? This sinner that you judged. I want you to look at what she's doing right now. I want you to look at how she's pouring her heart out to me in worship. I want you to look at how she's being extravagant and how she is washing my feet and showing her love for me. I want you to, to take a look. It would have been such a contrast, right? And this is what he says. He even points out, her sins are many, but she is forgiven. She loved much because she was forgiven much. And what he says in response to Simon, he says, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Loves little. Church, we know that Simon had sin too, right? <laughs> but he was a Pharisee. He was separated. He was the one who was viewed as righteous. He was the one who was viewed as closest to God, not this woman. He was viewed as one close to God. And so in our day, I want you to know this, is that when we read the scriptures, uh, oftentimes we have like a, 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 a spectator seat into the story, right? We weren't there. So we're just watching this from the outside. But anyone who would have been there uh, in that day would have sided probably with Simon. They would have thought Simon was the righteous one. But Jesus points out that she's actually the one who is right. She's the one who actually received me. She's the one who actually is worshiping and honoring me. And I want you to pay attention to this woman. The teaching point. Those who are forgiven little love little. And the contrast is also true. Those who are forgiven much love much. I want you to know something this morning, church, is that God knows all of our stories. Doesn't he? He knows them. He knows every part of our life. He knows every decision we've made. He's known every thought we've had, even the things we've never told anybody. He knows. He knows just like he knew the woman's story, just like he knew Simon's story. And all of us, church, have a tremendous debt towards God. We all had that debt. We might think, and we might want to be like Simon, maybe in the story, and think we don't have much, but the truth is we are like that woman. We have much sin that needs to be reconciled back to God. And when I think about my own story and I think about my own sin, I think, what, what mercy of God? What mercy of God that he would forgive all of my sin? What love of God that he would extend such kindness towards me, a sinner, having no right, no right to be in a relation with me, but he has received me in as a son. Does anybody know what I'm talking about this morning? Like, how thankful are we that God has been merciful to us? But I want to ask a question, and this is where I want to kind of land the plane this morning is, how extravagant in response to God's mercy is our worship? How are we responding to the mercy of God? This woman isn't just a woman in a story. She's meant to be an example for all of us. Now, obviously, we can't see Jesus in the flesh right now. Amen, right? He's not here on earth in the way that he was before. But I still think it begs the question about how we respond to God in the deepest parts of who we are and how do we express our affection towards God. It's all connected to the mercy we've received. And so the story ends here, and the, the accounting here ends here 
in verses 48 through 50. I want to read this for us. And he said to her, Jesus says to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Can you imagine what that would have been like for her to hear that from the Messiah, from the King of Kings? Your sins are forgiven. She was a well-known sinner, and yet Jesus is declaring that she is a forgiven sinner now. She's been set free. And to do this in the audience of other people that Simon had brought to his table to hear this. In verse 49, it says, And those who were at the table, so there were others besides Simon, began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Right? It's a fair question. Who is this that's forgiven sins at my table? And obviously we know that this is Jesus who is God in flesh. But this was revelation for those that were in the room. And then Jesus says, and he says to the woman a second time, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The whole idea of forgiveness is that we have this debt that's owed and that Jesus chooses not to hold that against us anymore. There's a legitimate offense towards God for all the sins that we have committed towards God, and he chooses not to hold it against us. He chooses not to. He forgives all of that debt. And the amazing thing of forgiveness is that it's, it's a great example of what mercy actually is. Mercy is not giving us what we deserve, right? Just like in the picture of the two debtors who owed a lot of money, they didn't deserve to have those debts forgiven, did they? but they are forgiven anyway. And this is what God has done for us. And so, church, I want to ask you a question. Do you know what God's done for you? Do you know what Jesus has done for you? If so, then our worship should reflect that. Worship is a response to someone or something. It's someone that we, we value or something that we treasure, something that's of worth to us. And it's a response to beauty and to greatness. Isn't that our God? When we think about what he's done for us. I think about this song, and I don't know if you've heard this song before. The lyrics of the song, His Mercy is More. Let me read these for you. What love could remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient all knowing he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins they are many, his mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam. What father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. And the refrain is right. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morning. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Isn't that cause for celebration? Isn't that cause for blessing of God? Isn't that cause for wanting to pour out our hearts to him in worship? I want you to know that this morning, church, just like Jesus responded to the woman, he's still in the business of forgiven sins. Amen? He still forgives sins today. He's also in the business of still receiving worship as God. Now, I want to know two things about worship as I wrap up here this morning. Obviously, worship is an inward response to God, but it always has an outward expression, right? Worship comes from the deepest part of who we are when we respond to who God is, but always expresses itself from the outward. So this is why when we come to a place like this where we're here to worship, right? We're here to, to worship God today. There can be an inward response to God, but it's meant to have an outward effect. We can have this moment of worship, but it's also meant to be a lifestyle of worship. In fact, if we're worshiping God regularly, it's not just this morning when we're just singing our praise to God. It's what we do when we go home later today. It's what we go out and do in service, the ways in which we obey and love God with our lives. It's it's both of these things. But I want to point this out because sometimes worship is one of those things that we think that we come just on Sunday and now we just had worship, right? But our lives are meant to be worship. Our lives are meant to be towards God. 
and praising him and honoring him. When I think about mercy, I just want to share this point with you. When I think about the mercy of God and all the sin that you and I have and we've accumulated over years of life, God could have just forgiven us and left things there. God could have just said, you know what, I'm not going to hold your sin against you because of what Christ has done on the cross, because of his blood, because of his payment. I'm not going to hold that sin against you, son and daughter, right? He could have stopped there. But we know that he didn't stop there. He actually invited us to sit at his table. I don't know if you realize that today, saints, but we have a seat at the Father's table as sons and daughters. So it wasn't just that he forgave us. He brought us into the family. He adopted us into the family of God. And then he didn't just do that. He then also brought us to this place where now he calls us friends if we do what he says. Does anybody have any friends like that? Jesus says to his disciples, you're my friends if you do what I say. Does anybody have any other friends like that? I don't. That would not work. But with Jesus, it works because he's also Lord. And so he's invited us into the most personal depth of relationship with him. That seems to me cause for worship. That seems to me cause for praise. We read this earlier from Romans chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God or because of the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. What Paul is saying is that you and I can't repay this debt, but in response to the goodness of God, we should live lives that reflect the fact that we're forgiven. We should live lives that look like we received the mercy of God. We should live lives that look like we're living in obedience to God because we are. This is our spiritual worship. The extravagance of worship comes out of the extravagance of mercy. The extravagance of worship comes out of the extravagance of mercy. I don't know about you, but when I think about my journey with the Lord, there are days where I do not feel like worshiping God. Is anybody there? There are days where my heart is struggling. I have a hard time believing who God is. There are moments where my flesh is very weak, and I don't want to acknowledge God. I might be the only one in the room. Anybody else here struggle sometimes? There's a couple of us. Okay. If we remember the mercy of God, if we remember his goodness in our life, it would lead us back to that place of worship. And sometimes you and I have to remind ourselves of what God has already done, right? As we look forward, we also have to remember back. All through the scriptures, you see this call from God for the people of God to remember because we easily forget, and we're fickle people, aren't we? We can be kind of fickle. But God calls us to remember because we forget what God has already accomplished for us in Christ. And so this is the platform in which we then respond in worship. We respond with extravagant worship when we know that we've received extravagant mercy. It's not hard. It's really not hard when we realize that we've been forgiven and set free. I want to close with this scripture from Ephesians chapter 2. The scripture reads this way. And you were dead in your trespasses and the sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. By grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. But God, being rich in mercy. Lord, as we 
meditate on your word this morning as we think about your mercy. Help us not forget you. Help us not forget where you've taken us from. Help us not forget what you've done in our life. Thank you. It seems like it's not the right word, Lord, but thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for the but God in Ephesians 2. Lord, we love you. We ask for your help to learn how to live lives of worship. Help us learn how to honor you with not just our praise and our song and our prayers on Sunday morning, but in every part of our life. When even when no one's looking, God, when we're in our prayer closets and we're with you, God, help us, Lord, respond appropriately to who you are and what you've done for us. We ask this in your strong name, Jesus, and all God's people said, amen. amen. If you can stand and you're able to stand, let's close out our service today with Jesus paid it all in the red hymnal number 305. Brothers and sisters, I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is 
your spiritual worship. Go in peace.